Do you want me to start? No, I'm going to do introductions. I'll do a quick introduction. Okay, all right, good. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everybody. This is Jerry Hulton, and I'm uh, pleased to be here with a a really great panel to discuss uh, the Biden agenda. Uh, When this panel was created, uh, there was only one big topic on the agenda, which was the Biden agenda, the domestic agenda. But now, of course, we have Ukraine and a much bigger uh, uh, discussion to hold. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to consider that Biden's already passed a uh, infrastructure bill with a billion plus. Uh, he's passed the uh, American Recovery Plan with uh, 1.9 billion. Uh, normally, that would be an amazing presidency. And yet this time, because there's a promise of a uh, $4 billion social infrastructure bill, now down to two, maybe down to whatever Joe Manchin wants, uh, he's up against a, a wall of uh, things not done. And he's got a Supreme Court justice to a point who will often be uh, controversial. So there's a lot for him to do. And it looks like by the fall, he could lose the House of Representatives to the Republicans and might even lose the Senate which point the Biden agenda will be a whole nother discussion. And then you have to add Ukraine into the puzzle. So uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm Jerry Hulton. I've fought in Vietnam. I've advised presidents. I've been undersecretary of the Navy. I've run universities in New York City. And I work on smart cities around the world. That's my passion is to make cities better. So with that background, I want to start with uh, Michael Brown. Michael Brown's a shadow senator from uh, Washington, D.C. He knows uh, both uh, what it means to be a street politician, and he also knows what it means to be in the halls of Congress. So, Michael, uh, talk a little bit about where do things first, what's been accomplished by President Biden and where do we go from here? What do you see next? Well, I think you've done a good job, Jerry, talking about what the president has so far accomplished. Uh, in the the face of great challenges, you know, that he's passed these two bills that you talked about uh, in the midst of a pandemic, which is really, uh, it's had to be his top priority. And as you know, the country's very divided. We're even divided on how to deal with the pandemic. We have people that don't want vaccines. We have people that won't wear a mask. It's been a big political struggle. And it really... um, emphasizes the divide we have in America right now. Uh, If you know, if you remember the election uh, that we had uh, in uh, 2000, um, Joe Biden just barely, really just barely won. The country was split straight down the middle. Uh, He had a decisive victory, but uh, in terms of the Electoral College, but in the terms of the popular vote, uh, we, the country was really, really divided and remains divided. So he faces a lot of challenges, and I think he pointed them out pretty succinctly in his State of the Union speech the other night when he talked about the economy and uh, he talked about uh, building a better economy. Use the example of an Intel facility, which is opening in, in um, Ohio, which will provide uh, literally thousands of jobs in Appalachia uh, for new technologies. Uh, So that's still something that he has to, uh, that we have to work on. And that's certainly central to his agenda. Uh, In Congress, we're having, we're we're also equally divided. Uh, Senator Manchin seems to have forgotten that he's a Democrat. (laughs) <laughs> uh, he stands alone because he likes the attention, I believe, and uh, this is a problem for us. Uh, but um, you're right. It, it looks like, uh, as traditionally happens in American politics, he will lose the House of Representatives in 2022 and may even lose the Senate. And, and that would be disastrous for him if he lost the Senate. What little leverage he has right now Uh, he has in the House of Representatives. Uh, And if he loses the House, which is likely, his only, the only recourse he'll have is to go to the Senate. And of course, the Senate is his uh, home base. He knows it 
uh, probably better than anybody. He spent so many years uh, as a senator. Um, so he, he also has to deal, and he made this a priority, uh, with health care in America. He, you know, we still have a big problem with things like prescription drug costs and, and, and other things, and there's lots of controversy on that. And as America ages, we're aging quickly, this has become a priority for him. So the pressure that's coming from old people like me is being countered by pressure from young people who want to see racial justice. You know, we had this terrible incident with George Floyd, uh, and and it, 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 it reawakened America to the fact that, um, you know, 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement, we still have uh, a racially unjust society there's not equality and and so there's pressure coming at him from both both uh uh both angles to work towards racial justice and then you throw ukraine in the middle of this and this is really <coughs> taking everybody's attention right now hasn't it and joe biden is is may in fact be a president of uh, of for the times you know we talk about how history makes presidents and, and we, we've seen actually makes world leaders. We've seen this with, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Roosevelt, uh, Kennedy, Truman, Churchill, uh, perfect people for the times in which they ruled. And you might find that with Joe Biden too. The American people elected him because they had just come out of such a tumultuous period uh, with Donald Trump that they wanted a strong and steady hand. And that's really what Joe Biden is. And so I think that moving forward, you'll see him continue to be resolute about these basic things, the economy, healthcare, racial justice, and how far we get though, how far his agenda moves uh, will really be based on world events right now, I think, because he has a, a short window of time here to move things forward yeah. uh, before the elections and before um, he faces a whole set of new domestic challenges. Yeah. So thank you, Senator. So the so, uh, pressure's on, I would say, is the message. Uh, yes. Joel, You've spent a lot of time around the world, uh, China, India, Africa. Uh, in many ways, the world you work with is the world that we hope turns democratic and not turns to understand what it means to be an uh, a entrepreneurial economy. Yet, uh, with what you just heard, domestic agenda alone, plus Ukraine, this, the developing world could fall off the agenda entirely, yeah. or certainly hard. So what do you think? What's your view of the situation from your perspective, moving as you do Algeria, Dakar, and other places? Well, thank you uh, for, 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 for inviting me today. I'm very, uh, very happy to discuss, uh, first of all, expectations on new presidents. Uh, I happen to be French, and we're very good at expecting too much from presidents. Uh, we do that from our presidents, uh, uh, and we do that especially also on uh, U.S. presidents. We expect maybe too much on U.S. presidents, especially when they're, when they're Democrats. So I like your question about turning Democrat uh, and Democratic, but maybe Democrat as well. Uh, I think what part of the developing world I'm, I'm working with, but also part of the progressive world in, in Europe is expecting from uh, American presidents lies on two things. First of all, climate change initiatives, leadership and second uh, to give i would say clarity in international relations uh, for the sake of time i'll go through bullet points maybe on those two aspects yeah. on climate change uh, you've mentioned the huge uh, 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 energy program on the domestic aspects that's for the contribution of the u.s to the world to fighting the climate change and that's very welcome i think Two additional things are still expected uh, in some sense. Uh, the climate finance, the climate finance at the level, at the global level, is still under uh, shaping, both for uh, 
uh, mitigation that concerns Europe. We have this Fit for 50, this Fit 55 uh, package. Uh, we're talking about carbon tax, but that concerns the developing world as well. Sometimes not so much because they say, you know, I think this is an old story when they used to say, no, we're not historically responsible. Now they have more finer argu arguments saying that they're already on low carbon path and development. So I think that here we have a need that the North, uh, that's Europe, plus the US discusses with the developing uh, the developing states and, and some emerging countries, which are no longer for talking about the emerging countries on this low carbon path. And the second point, which is might be missing in the conversation on climate change, is the industry. Uh, having climate change, uh, fighting climate change, having a transition path, is not just about adding new renewables, it's also about a whole transition, it's about new technologies, it's about new industries. Europe is an, has an industrial trajectory. The U.S. have. Uh, both our regions have deindustrialized to uh, the countries you mentioned, some of the developing and emerging countries. I think there is a promising trend, whether uh, 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 the White House is Republican or Democrat, uh, we ought to work more in terms of industry cooperations, not just competition. Competition is fair, but programs, cooperation is fine. That's for climate change. Mm -hmm. The second, on clarifying the, uh, the, the international agenda, and as we talk about Ukraine, I think it's very important. We saw two Joe Biden, I would say. The first Joe Biden came to us uh, and said, we want to care again for our allies. And we spoke about NATO. And uh, when we spoke about NATO, everyone in Europe expected to talk about Russia. But Joe Biden came and talked about China, not so much Russia, not so long ago, a year ago, and kind of gave the sense to some European leaders uh, that uh, the vision that the uh, U.S. had on China was the kind of main vision to have and that continuing the discussion with China, especially on public goods and climate change, even that would be difficult. So that created some kind of... of, of, of issue with this first Joe Biden. Now comes the second Joe Biden, with whom we are much more aligned uh, uh, on, on Ukraine. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, and I skipped, because you've been in the Navy, I skipped the episode on AUKUS. I think on AUKUS we can work together. Uh, submarine contracts are nothing compared to global security. Uh, the French have got that, I think, and, and <coughs> there is a need of a strong discussion on AUKUS being extended. But back to what we see in Ukraine, and that will be my last point, my last bullet point. What we've seen, I would say, uh, and I hope I don't have too much of French glasses on that, we've seen that, in a sense, the leadership has been uh, European in terms of accelerating the measures, in terms of uh, making them maybe stronger than what the White House would have wanted to do or what, uh, uh, what uh, Wall Street would have wanted. And I, I don't think it's bad. I think that the consequence is double. The EU and NATO are closer, and the NATO can have two feet. And I think a NATO with two feet would be more balanced. Thank you. And yeah, it's very helpful. So uh, now I want to talk to uh, Prime Minister Aho. The, uh, there you are uh, sitting on the border with Russia for uh, historic times. And the relationship, in some ways, Finland's done a good job of balancing that relationship and remaining a uh, independent country uh, most of the time. Uh, so uh, I'm really interested in your view now as we move towards Russia, as uh, Aves began to put on the table, the Ukraine. What do you make of the current situation? What's this do to the Biden agenda? Uh, where are we headed? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm very pleased to, to join this uh, session. Um, by the way, uh, President of Finland is just now, maybe in this hour, uh, visiting the White House. So, so okay. he's going to meet uh, President Biden. And I'm, uh, I'm quite confident that they are going to speak about Russia, Ukraine, and, and uh, the future uh, of the European security system and, and even global security system. Uh, I'd like to analyze first 
with a couple of words what's going on in Russia because I think that is something unexpected. I, I'm, I'm, I have spent a lot of time in, in Russia working with Russians and um, I have to say that uh, this uh, outcome uh, has become uh, as a big surprise. Uh, I don't know if you play with cards, but there is uh, a term all in. And uh, we are playing all in when we are close to lose uh, uh, all our money. Uh, I don't understand why President Putin decided to play all in in these kind of circumstances. That is not typical for Russians. They are not taking risks like this, this typically. I think one reason for that is that he achieved or he promoted one target in a massive way uh, eight years ago when he decided to, to occupy uh, the Crimean uh, Peninsula. He actually created uh, a national unity in Ukraine. Before that, Ukraine was, was divided. It was not a, nation, a real nation. But since that, it has become a real nation. And we have seen that now when they are fighting for their independence in a way which was, I think Russians couldn't expect that. And they made a big mistake when they started this, this war. But secondly, what Mr. Putin has achieved as well, he has created unity among the European Union countries and also promoted in a massive way transatlantic collaboration. No one was even, even dreaming about this kind of European collaboration that happened now within a few days. And Hungary, for example, Hungary and Prime Minister was in Moscow two, three weeks ago, and he said Hungary will not join any, any, uh, any new, new uh, um, uh, efforts against uh, Russia. But when this was made, it was completely uh, 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 unanimous you know, in, in the European Union. So that has happened. Secondly, when you look at the risks uh, Russia has taken, uh, there are four kinds of risks. Military, political, uh, economic and technological ones. And, uh, and uh, I think the, the present leadership of Russia or, or Mr. Putin, he, he is quite confident that he can handle uh, uh, both uh, uh, military risks and political risks by using force and uh, using, using capacities created for that. But to be honest, I don't believe that he understands what does it mean to be part of the global economy and part of the global technological development. I, I think they miscalculated in a massive way that aspect, and, and they are paying very high price for, for, for that. Then, uh, how to come out of this? I have uh, one wish for, uh, actually, it's partly for the United States as well, because there is only one person who is able to stop Mr. Putin, and that is President Xi. If China is coming to the table and saying, stop the war, that is going to work. And I'm quite confident that uh, uh, President Biden is not only having, having discussion with the Finnish president, but he's for sure having dialogue with, uh, with the Chinese leadership as well. Yes. And I think that is something uh, Americans should play well this, because, because I think in certain areas, China and the United States, or the United States and China, are in this case on the same side, and they can do something together. Um, and then finally, a few, uh, let's say, consequences and uh, and uh, let's say agenda issues for for uh, for Mr. Biden. For the first, I think we have already seen a return of uh, transatlantic collaboration, and that is something we missed. Uh, more or less with the previous administration. And that is something we have taken very seriously. America is, is seen in Europe you know, as a totally different kind of country and partner today than a few years ago. Secondly, uh, secondly uh, we have seen also a different type of leadership in the United, uh, in the United States. Uh, you mentioned already that Mr. Biden has long experience. He has been there since the beginning of 1970s, and you can see it easily. He is confident what he is doing, and I, I think he has shown leadership. Thirdly, we need a lot of uh, predictability, so that so that I think Europeans and Americans have to start working in the way what that we can we can create 
much better visibility where we are going to go together. And finally, we have to fight for the, for the uh, rule-based global system. Russia, Russia case is a good case showing what does it mean when, when a major country is, is uh, giving up all the rules we have created for the global community. And I think in this area, Americans and, and Europeans are on the same side. And we can, we can do a lot, like we have seen. We can do a lot if we are committed to, to get results. So I'm uh, pessimistic that we are going to see a lot of uh, bad things to happen in Europe. But I'm optimistic that this uh, transatlantic collaboration is going to work better than anyone was able to predict uh, a few months ago. Thank you, Prime Minister. And I have uh, a question I want to ask, but I want the, uh, Judge Rakoff to uh, have his uh, time. And, and maybe, Judge Rakoff, uh, rule-based systems have been raised. Judges certainly pay attention to rule-based systems. And uh, secondly, uh, you often have to find compromises in the midst of conflict uh, where uh, people learn how to work together, settle their cases. So I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on what you've heard already. And then we'll go to a Q&A because there are people wanting to ask some questions. So, Judge, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I should mention at the outset that for the last 12 years, I've been banned from traveling to Russia. The reason was that 12 years ago, a high-level Russian general was tried in my court. He had a sideline. He was also a major drug dealer. Uh, on an international scale and uh, was, uh, among other things, distributing heroin uh, to the streets of New York. Uh, and I sentenced him to 20 years. Um, and Mr. Putin took it personally and banned me from Russia. Uh, but uh, since my great-grandparents fled from Russia over 100 years ago, I wasn't too upset. Uh, the, uh, I think that uh, President Biden uh, faces some very severe challenges that uh, Senator Brown alluded to, less so on the international side. It's one of the few areas where uh, Americans from both uh, sides of the aisle, so to speak, are rallying around the president. Uh, but definitely on the domestic side. And I wanted to mention uh, something that hasn't been uh, mentioned yet, which is the role of the Supreme Court. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court has always played a greater role in uh, the United States than comparable courts in most countries of the world. Um, but it's become uh, ever more politicized. And uh, the uh, it now has a, um, a, a far-right majority. And, uh, for example, Senator Brown referred to climate change and, and President Biden's uh, many efforts to address that issue. Well, the Supreme Court is busy talking about whether uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, uh, should have much more limited powers uh, than it has historically had. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of issue that the Supreme Court in the United States can address in a way that would not be true in most countries of the world. And I fear very much uh, that um, a lot of uh, what President Biden uh, wants to do will be stymied not only by the next election, but mm -hmm. also by the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, now, I should also mention in that regard that President Biden's own judicial appointments and now the nomination of Justice Jackson to the Supreme Court have been, in my view, extraordinary. The classic federal judge in the United States, as throughout most of the world, uh, is a former prosecutor. I was a former prosecutor. Uh, and that loads the system, frankly, in favor of the government. Uh, and uh, President Biden, for the first time in American history, as far as I'm aware, is appointing persons from a defense background to the court. And they also happen to be mostly women and many of them persons of color. So it's been a really uh, uh, terrific uh, change. Uh, but it's not enough 
and it won't affect the Supreme Court. Um, in the United States, as you all know, federal judges have lifetime tenure, and personally, I'm all for that. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, nevertheless, uh, it means that when you uh, appoint someone to the Supreme Court, they're there for a long time uh, and will have a lot of uh, influence. In terms of your broad question, Jerry, about how do you reach an agreement uh, when you're uh, at war or when you're uh, have um, uh, great adversaries. Um, my experience is mostly limited to settlements in the courts. And when a lawsuit is brought, both sides hate each other. Uh, and how do they come together? And uh, usually the way a judge gets them to come together is by pointing out their weaknesses. Um, uh, you're going to lose this case maybe because of X or Y or Z. And then you say the same thing to the other side. And uh, they have brought the lawsuit because of their strengths. They settle it because of their weaknesses. Now, I think that might apply on the international level as well. Good. That's uh, an insight. And let's follow up on that. Uh, return to... Uh Prime Minister Aho, the uh, uh, the question of an off ramp for Putin and a question of an off ramp for Russia. Uh, what's your experience in Finland? Can that be negotiated? Can weaknesses be demonstrated enough if there's a change in position? Or does Putin feel quartered? Does the New York Times today saying that the concern he's going to be quartered and just double down all all in? When you play all in. Actually, you have only one way out. Yes. yes. Unfortunately, there isn't one only one way out. Yeah. And 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 uh, I expect that uh, all these four. Actually, when I mentioned all these four risks he has taken, each of them can be can be enough. So, if political risk is going to be realized, he's going to be gone. If the, if the economic risk is going to be realized, he is going to be gone. But technological risk is the biggest one, actually. Okay. It's not that visible yet, but on the longer term, uh, it, it will be. And I can see inside Russia two generations. This uh, Putin generation, which is still uh, Soviet uh, Soviet generation in a way. Yeah. And, and he believes that Russia can be like a battle, so it can be it can be isolated from the outside world. But the younger generation is understands that uh, it's right. totally dependent, not only economically, but technologically dependent on the, on the, on the Western world. And I, I think this is a huge generational issue as well. Uh, I hope that this new generation, which is close to come, is not going to be destroyed by this effort. Yeah. If not, they will take over someday. I don't know when, but they will take over someday this, uh, that country. But there is a risk that this war is going to destroy the future of the, of the country. And that is that will be have it will have dramatic consequences. I'm, I'm sure about that. Yeah, I would agree. My, I, I've spent time in Russia, uh, Moscow, working with the young entrepreneurs. And I will say they they're very eager to be part of Europe. They're eager to be part of the global economy. And I think they feel stifled. And this, of course, will increase that even more. And we can see which uh, which way. If they survive, they'll be a hopeful sign. Yeah. So, uh, the uh, uh, how does the uh, Joel briefly from you? What's your view of uh, how's the developing world view this war? Is this uh, uh, on the agenda? I've noticed a lot of abstentions from Africa, et cetera. Is this just? waiting to get clarity, or is this truly a concern about uh, declaring for one side or the other? You're on mute, I'm sorry. Still on mute, Joel. No, I thank you for coming back to me on this question. Uh, uh, the think tank I, I, I chair has more than half of its board members and activity coming from developing countries, uh, uh, Africa being sizable in it, India being sizable in it. Uh, I think what uh, 
this part of the world thinks about the current crisis is absolutely clue. Their current perception is, I would say, very aligned to what the Prime Minister was just saying. They care for future for Ukraine, but they equally care for a future for Russia and for the younger generations. They understand that they've been sensitized to uh, the collapse of some countries, Syria, Libya, uh, Iraq. So they've been wary with the interventions of what they call the West. They don't see so much that this time the West has changed, that this time you cannot compare. Comparison is no reason, but they're very concerned with that. That's very important. And the generational aspect, the technological aspect, the willingness to connect to a world which is where they can see uh, that this world no longer works on the premises of the 20th century is important. That's why what was mentioned earlier, clarity in the international relation, mm -hmm. balance, even if, you know, this uh, fantasy of one country one vote is a, is a good fantasy, that is a fantasy. But some, sort, some sense of balance, some sense of rules is important. And I think that what, all to, what will be done in the coming weeks in Ukraine and on Ukraine, not just on the military side, but also on mobilizing financial tools, economic tools, will be important to give a sense to uh, developing countries that they can adhere to that or that they should refrain from adhering to it. The uh, uh, question was raised of the role, uh, actually the point is made that she could be the uh, determining player in this. Uh, Africa, of course, has a lot of relationships to China. Uh, I think some viewed as positive developmental infrastructure, but some negative to it because of the debt load. Uh, do you see Africa as potentially a sort of a adding to the conversation with China, saying we need this clarity, we need you to step in and get focus back on the whole world, not on just a conflict? I'll be very quick on the billion-dollar question. Uh, two things. First of all, many of our African friends tell us we're done with China. We've got what we had to get from China unless they refine the relationship. But we got the infrastructure, we got the debt, we got the loans. They don't provide the equity. The West gives the equity. They don't provide sophisticated markets, sophisticated finance. The West might be providing it. Uh, they don't help us so much in our position within the international system. And they'll, they've helped us, we Africans, diversify our relationship, leverage on this Chinese relationship with the other continents, countries, and powers. So... In a sense, they got most of China, and they understand the difficulties that China will have. Now, on this uh, situation of Ukraine, as I observe and as we observe as a think tank very closely the Chinese reaction, what we see today, we see something that many commentators have, uh, have mentioned already. We see a growing discomfort with, uh, with Russia. Not so much because, uh, I mean, for two reasons. One, because as was mentioned, uh, Russia has brought the West together, back again. And uh, it's no good news for China. <laughs> the second reason is that uh, Putin, being an ally of, of, of Xi Jinping, has uh, crossed a border Xi Jinping doesn't want, which is to, uh, 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 to, to, to contest borders. Yeah. Because to him, Taiwan is part of China, mm -hmm. and the day you can contest a border, you can contest this myth, this foundational myth for the Chinese Communist Party that Taiwan is part of China. They have time, but they don't want the vision to change. Hey, Michael, uh, in your work with uh, the Senate and with uh, President Biden, can you give us some insights into, uh, let's say, how strong he'll be, how creative he'll be, and building a bridge, for instance, to Xi and uh, having Xi begin to move our direction and uh, well, pressure on Russia? Well, I think, you know, that, that there is obviously tension between the United States and China these days. But I can tell you from running a business for 25 years that you always listen to your biggest customer. And that's one thing that the United States 
Uh, you know, that's a hand that Biden will certainly play. The Chinese need the United States. They can make all the products they want, but if they don't have somebody to sell them to, it's, it's not going to help them. So I think that we will push our advantage in that way. And I think that people make a mistake. And I think uh, Putin has made a mistake. As the prime minister has pointed out, he, he not only unified Ukraine, he's unified NATO, and he will unify Americans. This is one thing that, you know, as divided a country as America is, this is one thing that we've always stood up for. You know, we believe in freedom. We believe in uh, uh, national borders, and we believe in, in uh, self-determination. So I think as these things start to coalesce, you'll see that uh, um, the Americans led by the president will push our advantage with China. We, we will. Now, how successful will be given the relationship they have with Putin? It's really hard to tell, but I think you'll see us, uh, you know, certainly uh, push that more and more as we go forward. So Judge uh, Rakoff, again, giving you the position of a sort of <clears throat> looking down on this as they, uh, you do from the bench. But what are your thoughts about how these cards play out? And you know, I like your idea of uh, focusing on weaknesses. Say a little more about how you think this plays out. Well, I, I'm no great expert on international affairs, but um, uh, I do think the potential weakness in the attitudes that Mr. Putin has uh, lies with China. And I thought Senator Brown had a very good point. Uh, we have the ability um, to impact and influence China uh, more than we have uh, to date. Uh, and that's the card I think we could ultimately play because if Putin saw that the war was being uh, taking away his alliance of convenience with the Chinese, I think that would alter the equation. Uh, so again, I'm no expert, but that would be my thought. Yep. So we're, uh, we're down to about five minutes and I want to reserve a little time for each of you to give a uh, closing statement. So is there something that we haven't discussed sort of burning on your agenda that you'd like to get on the table, and then I'm going to let you do closing comments. But anything I've missed or you'd like to ask of each other? Jerry, I got to tell you, I think you've, you've done a great job in covering. I've been a part of many of these panels, and this is probably the best one I've ever, ever done. So I don't know that there's anything out there to add uh, Besides that, which you're in, you know, you, you might query. Good. Well, I, I appreciate uh, that. I had some expectations for what you'd say, and you've been fantastic at uh, coming in on those points. So thank you. Joel? I, I could add one thing on what Senator Brown mentioned in his first, yeah. uh, in his first speech. Mm -hmm. uh, he mentioned about racial justice. Racial justice is a, is a core issue for the U.S., as we understand from here. It's a core issue for, uh, uh, for Europe internally, and it's a core issue for both the U.S. and Europe, uh, dis Europe discussion with the rest of the world. We see in this European crisis some comments coming from the developing world that Europe can uh, very easily welcome uh, Ukrainian migrants, that it was more difficult for Syria, Libya, or whatever, or, or, or for or Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think uh, maybe a way to overcome the, the, the bottlenecks in each of our siloed conversation on racial justice would be maybe to discuss it globally and, and to share something. But I agree with what Senator Brown said, that it, it's crucial in, in, in the new world we're entering. Now that would be... Uh, I, I agree. I think we have seen... Uh, well, it's, it's deeply into the... Uh, it's called the cultures of uh, the West, and it's taking a while to get it out of the cultures of the West, that's for sure. So, uh, well, with that, we have uh, about four minutes. So, uh, I'd be glad to have uh, each of you, if you'd like, sort of.
do a wrapping up statement about, I think, what is the, if you had a minute with Joe Biden, what would you say to Joe Biden about the uh, next three years? Michael, you could start. Well, I would say that you have to uh, aggressively pursue the agenda that you outlined in your State of the Union uh, message, uh, Mr. President. And the only thing that I would add uh, to what we've discussed here is that we've all touched on climate change. My hope is that uh, groups like Horus and the current situation that seems to be bringing people together will make us fully understand that we are no longer a group of nations, but we have to act as one world. You know, no country can solve the issue of climate change. This is something that we can all do, that we all must do together, or we will fail. So my hope is that as we move forward, we will realize that our coexistence depends on our cooperation and that the world will move forward more together than as the separate nations that, that, that have developed since the Second World War. And that's my, uh, that's my hope. And, and I hope that the president will stay strong. And let me tell Mr. Putin, if you think that Joe Biden is weak because you thought Donald Trump was strong, you make a big mistake. He, is, he has a backbone made of steel. Thank you. Prime Minister, your words for Joe Biden. Uh, I, I think it's important that uh, that President Biden will be committed not only in the military field for transatlantic, transatlantic collaboration, but also in the economic, technological, and industrial field. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes Mr. Putin and Russians typically do is that they believe win-lose win-lose options and win-lose cases. I, I think we have uh, good reasons to, to show that uh, transatlantic collaboration is able to provide win-win opportunities. And that's why I don't like this America first uh, approach. America together is, is much better. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Joel, we're running out of time, but quickly, final comment. No, I would I would just double the message, uh, win-win cooperation in, in, in technology and in industry. The two parts of the transatlantic family build the technology and the industry of the future for combating climate change, and, and we win-win. Great. Well, Judge, you get the final word. So, whereas Americans have united on their opposition to the invasion of Ukraine, they have not united on the issue of climate change. And I think uh, what will unite them, unfortunately, are disastrous effects. Uh, And I think uh, uh, the President Biden needs to uh, perhaps be uh, more aggressive uh, in pointing out that uh, hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, things that we've experienced to an extreme in recent years, are directly related to climate change. Um, So that would be my advice. Thank you. What we've, uh, as we predicted, done a great job of filling 45 minutes. It's been a really good conversation. I'm glad to know you all better, and I appreciate your taking the time to do this. So uh, thank you. here's for uh, hoping that weaknesses are revealed and that we uh, prevail and we stay united. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jerry. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Jerry. Bye. Uh, See you.